Uh, amen. Look at your neighbor and tell them it's so good to see you here. Amen. So Praise God. Tell them that you've never looked better. And then ask them for forgiveness. <laughs> amen. Praise God. It is great to be in the house of the Lord. I am so thankful. Praise God for his goodness and his, his love and his mercy. Amen. Amen. How many here are, uh, how many here were, were not born yet when the terrorist attacks on 9 11 took place? Raise your hand if you were not born yet. Okay. All right. Amen. Brother Churchill back there wasn't born yet. <laughs> Amen. So, those of you that were not born yet on 9 11, uh, you don't realize how different of a world that we live in today since that day. That that day changed not just America, it changed our world. Uh, December the 7th, 1941 is another day. I wasn't born then. <laughs> uh, a day that lives in infamy. Amen. Pearl Harbor, the attack of Pearl Harbor. That was another day that that changed the world. There are, there are days where they have major impacts and um, amen 9-11 certainly was one of those it changed our nation it changed our world and um, the reality is ever since then the world has kept on changing the rate at which it's changing has increased dramatically uh, the world today and you, you go back 10 years and it's already changed dramatically due to so many different factors technology social platforms uh, globalization I mean all that all that plays a part and and affects the world we live in affects our culture uh, amen as like as brother Seth already mentioned there are some that this is all when it comes to church this is this is all you you've ever known you've never known anything besides what goes on inside these buildings besides within the church and that's not a bad thing. That's, that's good. But it does narrow your view. Uh, amen. And I, and I think it's good uh, to have a, a broad view of, 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 of the world we're living in. Amen. Um, Riley, in our conversation we've had in the last few days, he's been just ex expressing how he, just, he, loves, he loves Japan. Japan is, he's like, Dad, it's so clean. It's so organized. Uh, they have a they have an amazing train system, he said, and and uh, he said over over there, uh, parents will put their children on the train, and let them go. He said it's just so weird. We don't do that over here. He said, matter of fact, when he does come home, he said it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a major adjustment again. It's a totally different culture. Now again, I'm sure there's there's pluses and minuses, and amen. Not everything here in America is is, is hunky dory. Uh, but but this is all I've ever known, and I'm 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 thankful. Uh, as one songwriter said, I'm proud to be an American, and I am, I am, Amen. Uh, there there are some things I'm not so proud about, but overall I am thankful to be. I'm thankful to live in a land of freedom. I really I really am, Amen. That not everybody has to look like I look and think like I think, Amen. That there can be. As, as it was stated years ago that the America we are the we're the melting pot of the world and uh, uh, again I, I am I am thankful for that um, if you have your Bibles I want to turn to the book of Luke chapter 19 I don't this is going to be a little different tonight uh, I'm going to really share my heart but uh, hopefully I'll make some sense that's the that's the that's the target here today amen um, Luke chapter 19 verses Beginning in verse 1, Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. Every time I say the word Zacchaeus, I have, to, I have to follow it. And he was a wee little man, was he? Amen. There was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector. And he was rich. And we could also add in there, he was also hated. <laughs> uh, he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, because he was of short stature. So he ran ahead, he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was 
going to pass that way. And Jesus, when he came to the place, he looked up and he saw Zacchaeus and he said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today I must stay at your house. I, I'm, I'm going to your house, Zacchaeus. So he made haste, came down, and received him joyfully. Amen. Verse 7 says, And when they saw it, who's they? The crowd, the people, the society. When they saw it, they all complained. What were they complaining about? Well, they were saying he's gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. And how could he ever do that? Why in the world is he having fellowship with that sinner? Amen. Not a whole lot to complain about, right? But why don't we, let's, let's put in there, for he who is a Democrat, or he who is a Republican, or he who is a homosexual, or he who is a gangbanger, all right, all these descriptions of all different types of people. Jesus went to their home, and they, the society, complained about it. Amen. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, look, I, have, I, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I'm going to restore to them fourfold. Amen. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. You can have, you can have a lost Republican, a lost Democrat. You can have a lost, obviously, a homosexual. Again, whatever, whatever tag you want to put on a person, a lost white person, a lost black person, a lost Hispanic a lost man, a lost woman, a, lo a lost uh, uh, trans. I mean, again, we're so good with labels, right? They're lost. Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save those that are lost. I don't know that we've ever lived in a more divided or divisive time than we're living in right now. Now, I want to tell you straight up, there is no way that every single one of us, and we're not a large crowd here tonight, but there is no way that every single one of us under the, in this building today are going to see eye to eye on every single issue. And guess what? That's okay. That's good. Really, that is good. And especially because we live in, a, the, in my opinion, the greatest nation in this world, it gives you and I the liberty and the right to have whatever view you want to have all right amen and so so tonight i, I want my, my subject is this holding steady in an unsteady world amen we live in a crazy world guys and, and we all know that and i don't want the craziness of this world to get me off my focus as to what i'm here to do what we're here to do amen Praise God. Lord, we are so thankful tonight for what we have felt in this service, your presence, your spirit. And Lord, we're thankful for your word and its power and its authority. And I, I do pray, God, as you will anoint our hearts, help us, Lord, not just to hear, but help us to receive, God, your word. And God, help, help it to be received and delivered in the spirit in which, God, you've desired. And I'm so grateful for your goodness, and we give you honor in Jesus' name. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated for a moment. Praise God. Today, obviously, is 23 years since the terrorist attacks that has become known as 9-11. And we do have a handful of people here that were not born at that time, but uh, the years have passed much quicker than I can fathom. Uh, they've just flown by. It was a Tuesday morning, and it will forever be embedded in my memory that, that Tuesday morning. I was getting ready for the day. Uh, my wife and I, we were, we were actually teaching in a Christian school at that time, Macy, and I don't know that Riley quite yet was enrolled, he, he was, but he, was, he would go with us, and, and uh, we were getting ready for the day, and, and it was on a, uh, we had a little bathroom radio that 
This is back before internet, all right? You couldn't stream anything online. You had to actually tune into a radio. And I, I would listen to the AM station news radio. And I remember as I was getting ready, I heard the, it first announced that a plane had crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. At that time, they were reporting that it was a private aircraft, that of a, maybe a Cessna. Uh, it was an accident. It, it, was, it was just an accidental crash. But it wasn't too much later that I and the rest of the world realized that it was no accident, but it was, in fact, an intentional act of terrorism. By the end of that day, 2,977 people had lost their lives. Again, we, we have, or for the last 23 years, we've always, if you're like me at least, I have been listening and watching uh, documentaries and, and uh, reliving those moments. And again, it's a, something that I, I don't ever want to forget. I want to remember uh, but I do. I remember the emotions uh, were very raw that day. We, we didn't have the media that we have today, but we went to the school, and, and I remember sitting there in, the, in whatever, the I guess, their fellowship area, and uh, we had tuned a, a, turned the TV on, was watching the newscast, and just watching that everything unfold, and the, the emotions were so real, they were raw, and uh, the uncertainty of what was ahead was, was in fact very present at that moment. I remember standing in line that afternoon at a gas station there locally uh, because the thought or the, the concern might be that we wouldn't have any fuel. So a lot of uncertainty was going on at that time. And I mean, times certainly since then have changed, uh, but the uncertainty of what is, what is ahead, that uncertainty still remains today, 23 years later. Amen? I suppose that that's something that will always remain, and that is that nothing remains the same. It is no question that the world that we live in today, post 9-11, uh, is a uh, much different. It's, it's changed tremendously since that day. We live in an ever-changing world. Amen. I, I, you know me. I don't get behind this pulpit. I don't... I don't promote i don't talk about politics but i'm going to tell you we've got a circus in our in our nation today and i'm talking republican i'm talking democrat and there's a lot to be considered i mean we've got a lot of influences but I, and that's not my focus here today but but there is such a such a change <laughs> amen even in in all aspects of our world this ever changing world and this a forever divisive world we live in amen people that that stand on different platforms that have different opinions and different viewpoints if they don't see eye to eye they can't be friends they can't even they can't even i mean you, you've got to cut everybody off if they don't look at things the same way that you look at things i i don't agree with that i really don't matter of fact i i i've often said and i mean this i i appreciate diversity i do and again, I think our nation, we ought, to, we ought to celebrate the fact that we've got the freedom to have different viewpoints. Amen. Again, this ever-changing world that is so divisive, uh, it, it can make it very difficult for us as a church to try to reach this world. We as a church, uh, obviously, to be, to be a, a Christian, it does not require a certain political uh, persuasion. Thank the Lord. Amen. Matter of fact, it's not up for vote. The Word of God is very clear what it takes to be required to be a Christian. Amen. And that's the authority in which we stand on. That's not debatable. But the fact of the matter is, we are, and we claim to be, the children of the redeemed, and our goal or our purpose is to reach the outside world. And it's challenging because there are, again, society is so divisive, and the church oftentimes is put in a bad light. Amen. Jesus, though, never let the opinion of society or that of culture uh, to ever inhibit him from doing what he was called to do. <laughs> in Luke chapter 19, in our text, we, uh, again, we read where he asked a man named Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector, who was rich, who probably hadn't been the most honest guy and, and had a bad reputation. We don't know all of that for sure, but it's, pretty, it, it's implied pretty heavily that, that Zacchaeus was not an honest businessman. And there no doubt had been people, and perhaps even in that crowd, that, that his 
actions had affected them in a, in a negative way, and yet Jesus goes and asks to go to his house for dinner. And there were those that day that, that watched this happen, and they started getting frustrated. How can he go to his house? Now, don't, don't think for a moment that Jesus didn't know that there would be people in the crowd that would not like his actions here. But he makes it very clear that, that his purpose isn't to appease the crowd. His purpose is to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. In the aftermath of September the 11th, when all commercial air traffic was in the United States was grounded, I didn't realize, I didn't, I come across this story this week. There was a single civilian plane that received special permission to fly. This aircraft was carrying a life-saving anti-venom that was traveling from San Diego, California, all the way across the nation to Miami, Florida. A snake handler in that state had been bitten by a highly venomous Taipan snake. That's scary. The emergency flight carried a, a critical payload of this monovalent anti-venom specifically designed to counteract the deadly venom of the Taipan snake. The specialized anti-venom, it was only available in two places, New York and San Diego. And so it, it was ne necessary for this urgent cross-country uh, transport. The snake handler, his name was Lawrence Van Sertima. Uh, he was in extreme dire condition in Miami's Baptist Hospital. He was bleeding from his eyes and his mouth as the venom was attacking his uh, multiple organs. Despite initial treatment from a, what's called a polyvalent uh, anti-venom, medical professionals determined that the Taipan specific anti-venom would be essential for his survival. So the critical flight carrying this anti-venom originated from San Diego it was bound for Miami, covering, a, again, a transcontinental a route across the United States. This journey was, was very challenging, given, again, the unprecedented airspace restrictions that were in place immediately following these 9-11 attacks. So to in, in, ensure the security during this very sensitive operation, the civilian aircraft was escorted by two fighter jets throughout its flight. The emergency flight successfully delivered the life-saving uh, anti-venom which was administered to Lawrence Van uh, Sertima within 45 minutes of the plane's landing in Miami. The, the rapid response proved very critical in, in counteracting the deadly effects of the snake venom. Van Sertima re recovered from the bite. He only learned about the terrorist attacks a few days later. He was completely unaware of the extraordinary circumstances surrounding his treatment, amen, that, that a flight was, one plane was allowed to fly across the nation to deliver to him this life-saving anti-venom. We live in a world today that is oblivious of its condition. <laughs> and while God literally moves heaven and earth for their benefit, they remain unaware, amen. And I realize that there's everything might be going in one direction, but I'm going to tell you, we best not be influenced by the crowd. We, when everybody says you can't do that, you can't go there, uh, you can't, you can't uh, uh, connect to that, I'm, I'm telling you, we got to be careful because we have still got a mandate from God himself. Amen. We are to be the hands and feet of God. It is our duty to fulfill His purpose, which is clearly stated in what's known as the Great Commission. Mark chapter 16, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Every. Amen. That means people that has a totally different paradigm than I've got. That means people that see things way differently than I see things. Those are still candidates for this great commission. For he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not will be, will, will believe will be condemned. 
He says, these signs will follow them that believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues, uh, take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Amen. But here's the thing. The gap between the church and that of the world is continuing to widen. And I understand we're not to be like the world. I am not implying that in any way. But we as a church, as, as we, we, we're going to remain steadfast and we're going to stay true to the Word of God. We're going we're to be faithful to what this... We're not going to water this down. We're not going to compromise this. We're not going to try to be like them to win them. But at the same time, we want to reach them. And I'm telling you, that the society we live in is, is the, the gap is forever widening. But nonetheless, it is still God's purpose to seek and to save the lost. Everybody say culture. Culture is complex. Culture is multifaceted. It's a concept that, 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 that encompasses the shared patterns of behaviors and beliefs and values and customs and, and practices uh, that characterize a particular group of people. It's the collective way of life that is learned, transmitted, evolves over time within a society. That's why cultures change. Think American culture has changed over the years. Church also has a culture. And it can be defined as the unique atmosphere, values, attitudes, practices that characterize a, a specific church community. It encompasses both the visible and invisible aspects of how a church operates, interacts internally and externally. I want to be healthy on the inside. We want to have, we want to have a, a, a church that's authentic, that's real, uh, but also uh, I believe a church that is healthy is going to affect externally as well. Amen. Everybody say purpose. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. I want to be about his purpose. One of our, 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 our slogans here, or whatever you want to call it, mission statement or vision statement, whatever it is, is making his purpose our passion. I want to be about his purpose. I want to live my life by, by, by accomplishing his purpose. Ephesians 2 and 10 says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The New Living Translation says we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. God has, in, in, he has equipped us, He has enabled us in order that we would accomplish His purpose. Jesus' purpose, as we've read to you, was what? was to seek and to save that which was lost. Let me tell you, his purpose was then, it's the same purpose today, and it's the same purpose that you and I ought to adopt in our lives as well. Amen. Philippians 2 and 13, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Amen. The NIV says, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. The New Living says, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. Amen. As widening as the gap is between the church and our society, I'm going to tell you, yes, it's challenging, no doubt about it. In 25 years of pastoring, this job is not getting easier. I, I understand that, but I'm going to tell you, God will still give us the power to do what His purpose is believe that i believe that amen first corinthians chapter 9 paul says for though i am free from all men i have made myself a servant to all that i might win the more and to the jews i became as a jew that i might win jews to those who are under the law as under the law that i might win those who are under the law to those who are without law as without law <laughs> Amen. Not being without law toward God, but under law towards Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. 
Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Amen. Let me read to you what the message says in verse 22. It says, I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ. But I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. What is he saying? This could somewhat be controversial, I guess. Paul wasn't saying, well, I, I need to reach, and this is extreme, I need to reach the alcoholic, so I need to go become an alcoholic. That's not what he's saying. And I think we can even draw a line here and say he probably wouldn't, if Paul was here today, he wouldn't necessarily say, hey, y'all need to go sit on a bar stool and reach the alcohol. I don't, I, I don't think he would say that, okay? Amen. But what he is saying is that we as a church, we have our own culture, and, and we stand on the things of God that are, that are godly. And I mean, there's, there, there's, I'm telling you, there's no boundary here, right? It is what it is. It's absolute. But at the same time, we're, we're to reach the world that's outside there. And I'm telling you, they're a whole lot different than what we are. Amen. Brother Seth, this may be all that you've ever known, but, but you're, you're rubbing shoulders every day with people that have no idea what goes on inside here. And we've all been there when, a, when someone comes for the very first time and we've watched the look on their face. They're shocked. I know how I was when I was 17 years old and come to a Pentecostal church for the first time. I thought, man, I'd only acted like that at a ball game. I didn't associate that kind of outward expression in a church house. Now, 30 years later, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about it. <laughs> Amen. So again, there is, a, there is a culture that is within the church. Somehow, we want to make the connection to those outside these walls. And I'm not going to be able to make that connection if I'm constantly pointing my fingers at them. Amen. So I've got to reach them. And that's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that, again, I didn't take on their way of life. I didn't become like that. I didn't, I didn't go smoke cigarettes and, 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 and tell, tell dirty jokes. And No, no, no. I didn't, but I, but I, did, I did try to enter their world and try to experience things from their point. I did try to see things from their point of view. We're so narrow-minded sometimes because, again, this is all we know. And so for us, it's hard to imagine anybody seeing things any differently than what we see things. But I'm going to tell you what, outside this world, the view and the vision is broad. Now, I'm not condoning and I'm not saying they're right, but I'm, what I'm saying is we got to make a connection there. And again, Paul said, I have, I have uh, I've adapted, didn't compromise, didn't, didn't, didn't change the message, but I have, again became about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead them. I've tried to somehow be able to make connection to the people out there. Amen. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching, talking to me today too. Because I'm, I'm not a big people person. And people can get on my nerves. I know I'm probably the only one here that ever that happens to. Amen. And, and, and sometimes people that have these such differing views can be, can be I'm going to use a word that's probably not kind, and I don't mean it in a negative way, but it can be just it's annoying to me. But those are the people I'm wanting to reach. So again, it's not about compromising my views, or, but it's, it's about being open to at least realize that they have a right to have the view. And at some point, I need to make a connection. I don't need to hate them for who they are. Amen. In, in 2011, Stanford professors named Sebastian Thrun and Peter Nor- Norvig decided to put their course in, in an introduction to AI. Sorry, I don't know what that is. Amen. To their astonishment. All right. 
with one couple ways to take care of that. Amen. But as I was trying to say, in 2011, they put this their, their, their course, Inter Introduction to AI, online for free, no charge. And uh, to their astonishment, 160,000 people signed up for this course. This being Stanford, the, the faculty saw a commercial opportunity that founded the, the first two companies to offer what became known as Massive Open Online Courses, or MOOCs. Thrun, he founded a company called Udacity, two other computer science professors, Daphne Collar and Andrew uh, Nig uh, founded Coursera. The problem was, though, that only one in 10 out of the 160,000 that enrolled in these free courses actually completed them. So as we all learned, again, uh, too well in the COVID-19 era, it's hard to sit for hours in front of a screen learning by yourself. But then something strange happened. Kohler and, and Israeli noticed that in Israel, some groups of people were completing the online courses at a rate of over 80%. As they investigated, she discovered that these were Israeli uh, high school students that were taking college-level courses from several leading United States universities. They shouldn't have been finishing these courses at all, let alone doing so with such high success rates. It wasn't that these kids were so smart. They were typical students from regular schools. The difference was that they were taking the courses together using a method called Team Classroom. It worked like this. The whole class would watch a video from the course. Next, every student would hold up a sign with one of three colors. Green meant that they understood the material well enough to teach somebody else. Yellow meant that they understood, but not, not well enough to teach anybody. Red meant that they didn't understand anything at all. Amen. Then the whole class would go at it with a single goal that everyone in the class would eventually be able to hold up a green sign. Rather than one against all, the students had to bring their classmates over the finish line with them. The system worked so well that teachers with no knowledge of the subject matter, but a knack for encouraging the students ended up to help them excel. Using this team classroom method, a high school Bible teacher could teach college level physics. When I read that, I thought, wow, what if we took that approach in our church? How many here understands the oneness of God? How many could actually hold up a green sign? How many here would be holding up a yellow sign? How many here would say, I, you know what, I don't really understand that at all? And it's no judgment. But we're not going to go any further until everybody can hold up a green sign. We're in our, in our culture, it's all about the individual succeeding. You know, valedictorian, salutatorian, you know. Rah, 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 rah. They need to have something like, like third from the bottom. What's their name? You know, no. <laughs> Which is fine, excelling, but, but what about the group? What about us together? Making sure that we all pull each other across the line. I've been sharing this with a few people, and, and I, I'm, 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 it's, it's really, it's getting me. It's a Hebrew word called gaboosh. Everybody say gaboosh. It's fun to say, gaboosh. Amen. Uh, it's one of those Hebrew words that there really is not a good English translation for it. Probably the word bonding or cohesiveness would probably be the closest. But, but neither of those concepts really captures the emotional power of the word gabush in Israeli society. See, gabush is not just a process or a description, but it is a deeply held value every one of you are valuable again I'm, I'm reading i'm reading a book on israel and so so you bear with me a bit but and i've shared this with few people but israel is one of those societies that i mean they're one of the smallest nations 
They're surrounded by nations that absolutely despise their existence. They have every reason to not be successful, but they are one of the leading successful nations in the world. Amen. Matter of fact, they have been listed as one of the happiest people, nations. And they don't even realize they're happy because Israelis love to argue. They love to complain. They love to bicker. In the, in the book I'm reading, he tells a story. He says, I'm driving down the road in Tel Aviv, and I've got a motorcycle in front of me, and this bus cuts the motorcycle off. The motorcyclist gets off his motorcycle, takes his helmet off, and starts beating the bus. And him and the driver, they get into it. He said, I'm thinking they're fixing to go to blows and somebody's going to get killed. But by the time it's over with, the motorcyclist is asking the bus driver for some directions. <laughs> they shake hands and go about their way. That's their culture. They're quick to, they're, they're quick to express their feelings. But here's the part of, the, of Gabush, is that nothing could ever be done to sever the tie of being a brother. We can have totally different opinions and we can express them emotionally. But at the end of the day, you're still my brother. I still love you. Now, I may not agree with you and, 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 and my emotions may, may, you may think I don't like you, but I'm going to tell you, nothing will ever sever the tie of being a brother. I thought, man, why don't we, we, need, to, we need to adopt that in the church. We need to adopt that in our nation. I'm telling you, friend, we're a part of the greatest nation in the world. And we're letting things divide us. And I know, I know it's on a national scale, but I'm going to tell you, we, we better never allow that to seep into the church. Because there's nothing that you could ever do to sever the tie of you being my brother or my sister. Why? Because we're in this together. And you've got value. And I want to make sure gabush <laughs> is something that we have making sure that every single one of you make it. It's not good. Now, now don't, don't get me wrong. I know I'm going to be held accountable. I'm going to stand before God myself. But I promise you, it is my life's goal. Myself, of course, my family, my children. But it is also my life's goal for every single one of you to make it. Now, sometimes people make really dumb choices. And, and, and we do. We've, we've all done that. But no matter how, how crazy the choice is or, or how, how, how consequential those choices could be, never should it sever the fact that you're my brother. Amen. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, it says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ... Neither is the, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Verse 28 in the Amplified says, There is now no distinction. Neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is not male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. We're in this together. Praise God. And whether I want to admit it or not, I, I really, I could use your help. And whether you want to admit it or not, you, you could use my help too. Together we're going to make it. Now, I say that, and I'm getting ready to land here in just a moment. All right, 29 minutes. I'm, I went long enough. Amen. I, I, I preference it by this. We're in this together. So if we're going to reach the world that's out there, there's not just, there's not, it's not just me. It's not just you. It's us together collectively that's going to work together a few months ago we we stopped having restart it's the recovery group that we've had for about five years and uh, we pushed pause on it we weren't we, we, we knew we weren't going to not have it again we just we, we, we pushed pause 
And so we're, we're revisiting it again, and we're, we're looking at what we're going to do. And here's what I, what I feel my concern was this. When we say the word recovery, 90% of us as members here think, well, I don't have, I had nothing to relate to recovery. I've never been addicted to drugs, never been addicted to alcohol. And so, so immediately we think of recovery, oh, that's, that's for those others. But that's not, and again, that we, that, that's not the way that we, or that I want to, it to be looked at. Because yes, I've never been addicted to drugs. I've never taken a hit off a joint. I've, I, I've, I've drank some alcohol when I was younger. Hate the taste of it. God made sure I could never be an alcoholic because I could not stand the taste. I tried smoking cigarettes and I would just get all choked up. Again, God made me, hey, you can't do that either. So I, I don't know what it's like to be addicted to those things. And so, yeah, I may not be able to relate to what you or those might be facing. But for me to think, well, that's just for those who, that's not, let me tell you, there's not a person here today that doesn't have need of some restoration in your life. And so, restart, we would meet, or they would meet on Thursday nights, every Thursday night. We had those that were faithful to it, that helped cook the meals. I mean, again, faithful every week, week in, week out. But the majority of us as the church, we didn't really associate, we didn't associate with it at all. We met Sunday to kind of discuss what we wanted to do going forward. And, and we all agree that, you know what, we need to rebrand this. This doesn't need to be looked at as a recovery group. Because there is not one person in this building today that doesn't have need for some restoration. And I think, again, as we're going to go forward, we're going we're to reintroduce this. It's going to take us a few weeks to do this. But I want every single one of us to understand that I need some restoration. And at the same time, amen, the things that God has restored in me, I can share with somebody else. That when it comes to reaching the people outside these walls that are so different than any of us, it's going to take a collective effort. Every single one of us realize, you know what? Those people have value. And I may not have a clue what they're facing, and I may not be able to sit down and say, hey, I know exactly what you're going through. But I'm going to tell you, I've got the same commission that Jesus gave. Jesus didn't understand what a sinner was like. Jesus couldn't relate to Zacchaeus. Jesus had no idea. But I'm going to tell you, Jesus had a love for people. So I, I, I covet your prayers as we go forward that, that all of us will understand, amen, that, that our, our whole, the whole purpose and goal and what we want to achieve, as we've said for the 11 years that we've been here, we're not here to, to, to gather a crowd, but we're here to build a church. And I promise you there are hurting people in this, in this, in this community. In just the last week and a half, I have personally came in contact with three separate families that have had members of their families commit suicide in the last three or last week and a half. All three were men. All three of them put a gun to their head and pulled the trigger. We tell you, they're hurting. And I can't just turn my head and say, well, that don't, that don't apply to me. I'm going to tell you, that's the kind of people we want to do what we can to reach. Remember, Paul said, amen, that I might by all means save some. Amen. We just want to do everything we can. Gather as many as we can. Reach out to as many as we can. But, but, but our effort of reaching out is not going to do, any, do us any good until we within understand, you know what? Every person has value. Every person in this church, every person in, in the people we rub shoulders with, God, I, I, my prayer tonight is that you would change the paradigm. The paradigm is the lens by which you view the world. I need God to change my view. As we stand here today, 
Amen. I realize I mean I may make some statements that's that's like a broad brush here. It's easy for me to see the the panhandler at the stoplight. And in my mind, I immediately go to the ones that take advantage of that and say, well, if I'm not careful, they have no value. Now, I understand, please, within context here. I'm not telling you, go, go give every panhandler some money. But I'm going to tell you, I want my heart to hurt a little bit. Amen. Maybe, maybe I don't give them any money, but I'm going to tell you, I, I, want, I want to see them as the, as the individual they are. I want to realize that, you know what, their soul has value. God, help me. Amen. I, I need my heart to be changed today. This is not just about me. It's, amen, it's about this crazy world that we're living in. As we're talking tonight, we're trying to hold steady in a very unsteady world. I'm going to tell you, if I will live my life according to what, how this book directs me to live, <laughs> there are many out there, church, that they, they need it. They, they're, they're yearning for it. They're looking for it. They don't even realize they're looking for it. Amen. But what are we doing? Amen. Don't, don't, don't drink that, <laughs> that divisive Kool-Aid out there that's, that brings such division. Let's value the people, the person, the, the soul that, of every individual. Amen. This evening as we come to a close, can we just for a few moments, God, we need you to help us. We need you, God, to change. Change us from the inside out. God, help us to see things the way you see things. Help us, Lord, not to look on just the outward, but to God to, to realize, Lord, that you, you value what's within them. Or those that are despised by society that, that, that would complain that you would even go visit their home God, help us to see, see the way you see it. God, to have the value that you have. Lord, help us to be, again, the hands and the feet. God, to do your will, to accomplish, God, your commission to preach the gospel to every creature. In the name of Jesus, help us today. Come on, church, let's reach out. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus today. Hallelujah, your word. Pull me in closer. Close to your heart